Welcome to GovCast, connecting with federal IT's top decision makers. I'm your host, Amy Kluber. The Department of Veterans Affairs has an important mission in serving our nation's veterans. And part of that really means honing in on the veteran experience. Veterans Experience Office's Deputy Chief Barbara Morton has a bit of an unexpected background. It's one in law. She discusses how she made the pivot to VA and the user experience, how she applies innovative ways of thinking about customer service and technologies to the agency, and a little bit about some of the projects on the horizon. Barbara, welcome to GovCast. It's so great to have you on the show today. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Excited for the conversation today. So talk through your journey to VA. How did you get to the agency? Well, so interesting. So I love telling um, a couple of stories about not only how I got to VA, but also how I got into the Veterans Experience Office. So backing up to how I got to VA. So I am an attorney by trade. And when I went to law school, I always knew that my target was going to be public service. So in the summertime, I would always do internships in different branches of government. And so I knew when I graduated and got my degree um, after a few clerkships in the New England area, I wanted to come down to D.C. and really kind of just make a contribution at the federal level. And so I was very fortunate to apply for an attorney position at a group called the Board of Veterans Appeals, which is essentially a group that adjudicates appeals on various benefits that veterans have been denied at a lower level. And so I was thrilled when I got the call to join. And, you know, it was funny because I hadn't necessarily targeted VA as, you know, the agency that I wanted to work for. I was really taking a more holistic approach, applying for a lot of different jobs across agencies at the time. But I knew that after I interviewed for this position and I was offered the position to come in, I just knew it was the right professional home for me. And so I've been at VA for about 15 years now in a variety of different jobs. And for me, I'm really motivated by serving a cause greater than myself. And that's really what has kept me devoted to this particular mission in this agency as well. That's certainly something I hear from other VA folks and leaders such as yourself is that mission really reigns true throughout every office and every project. And certainly people like me see that. (laughs) Yep, absolutely. I mean, in terms of, you know, kind of bridging my experience you know, from starting as an attorney at the Board of Veterans Appeals. And I was mentioning, you know, people always ask me, how the heck did you end up in the Veterans Experience Office? You know, you're an attorney. How does that work? And I always like to share a story. And I've, I've shared it many times. If, you're, if it's okay, if you'll indulge me with that. Yeah, I love stories. Yeah, well, it's, it's really near and dear to my heart. And so it kind of made sense to me when I was asked to come over here a couple of years ago to help stand up this office. So So when I was at the Board of Veterans Appeals, I mentioned I came in as an attorney, really got a front row seat into some of the pain points that veterans had experienced in the appeals process. It's very legalese, it's complex, it's not intuitive. And in one of my roles at the board, I had received a phone call one day from a veteran, a World War II veteran, and it was relatively unusual for me to receive direct calls from veterans because that just was not, you know, in my role at the time. But I was very happy to, to speak with this gentleman, and he was very kind of confused about the appeals process. He didn't understand what was going on with his appeal. And so I took his name and number and said, you know, let me kind of run it down and and see what's going on with this. At the time, you know, I started to kind of run to ground, you know, where it was, check, you know, kind of on the status. And it turns out at the time there was a paper file that we had to rebuild. We had to bring in some records and rebuild the file. And so over the you know course of a period of weeks, I would always check in with him at the end of every week just to give an update, status update, because I knew he was really anxious about it. And when we were finally able to rebuild the entire file and get it sort of back on its way, I called him and I, you know, I said, hey, um, you know, good news, you know, your appeal is back on track. And it was at that moment that he just gave me, you know, the most profound and meaningful compliment that I've really ever received in my career. And he said, thank you, Barbara. I trust you because I knew you would take care of me. And at that time, it just, it meant so much to me that I was able to earn the trust of this veteran who had been, you know, just reaching out, lost in the system, not really understanding how to navigate. And just by having um, those touch points with him, you know, just making him feel that way made me feel great. And so fast forward to 2016, when I was asked to come over to help stand up this brand new kind of capability, the Veterans Experience Office, what is this thing? You know, my compass really led me to that passion of wanting to replicate 
that experience for every veteran, every family member, caregiver, survivor that we interact with. So that's really what the driver was to bridge me into this role that I currently occupy. That is a great story. And especially for something like being in charge of, you know, the experience of veterans that that gives you like a, the first hand account of what it really means to put through some of these initiatives. So that's amazing. The VA has been going through quite a transformation and you've been here for quite some time now. Where does the veteran experience fit in? Is your, what is your office doing, you know, in terms of that, as far as the overall transformation? Yeah. So I think there are a couple of different dimensions. So, you know, it, there's sort of the strategic transformation, the cultural transformation, and then sort of the tactical things that we're doing to support it. And so I'll start with kind of the broader. So, you know, when I came over to the Veterans Experience Office, this was the summer of 2016, the office had actually been stood up back in January 2015. And as you may recall, it was in response to a trigger, a catalyst. And that was the Phoenix VA Medical Center crisis, a uh, wait time crisis, you know, bad time for veterans, of course, bad time for, you know, employees in the department. And so we had a new secretary come in at the time, Secretary Bob McDonald, who really saw as a symptom of what had happened in Phoenix, the fact that we didn't really have the mechanism or ability to channel the experience in a way that would make it understandable so we could actually see these signals bubbling up before they became in, in, turned into a crisis. And so he came in and he established this office in January 2015. I come in about a year and a half later. And I think at the time, it was really about, you know, putting a stake in the ground and elevating experience as a sort of co-equal measure of our performance, right? So you in VA, and I think any organization, have lots of metrics, right? Lots of performance metrics, a lot of operational metrics, which are very important. But I think with this office, the vision of it was to elevate experience as a co-equal measure of our performance. So we don't lose sight of some of these things that may bubble up, but operationally things are looking fine. Experience really allows us to sort of see around the corner and what we can do in advance um, at a strategic level to make sure that we can sort of balance that and address those issues. So that's sort of at the macro level, really a cultural transformation and making room for experience as this co-equal measure of our performance. I think tactically um, in terms of how we support the department. So we're considered a shared service office which means that we have support that we give across the organization, Veterans Health Administration, benefits, memorial services, and sort of VA cross-cutting initiatives. And we do that in a number of ways. The first, I would say, and kind of the most, one of the most transformational ways is through data. And when we talk about data, we talk about it in sort of two dimensions. One, of course, is kind of the real-time survey capability that we've established for the department. So in my prior life at the Board of Veterans Appeals years ago, we would have customer satisfaction, customer experience metrics, but they were very lagging indicators, right? They would come in, you know, months and months later, and it was very hard to action those. So what, what this office has done is built sort of a more real-time survey capability that can be leveraged across the department. The second dimension of data is human-centered design. So we have a practice that we've built over the last number of years to really, before we start trying to solve a problem, make sure we talk to veterans and their families to make sure we're identifying the right problem to solve, number one, and two, understand their journey from their perspective, pain points, bright spots. So we then craft a solution and design a solution around what matters most to the veteran. So that's kind of the big bucket of data. The second kind of core capability that we offer is translating that data into action. So something called tools. So we talk about data and tools. The hardest part, I think, of having any sort of repository of data, whether it's surveys or whether it's human-centered design insights, is that bridge and that translation part. So data for data's sake, you know, is shelfware and not usable? That's not going to be helpful. We need to be able to bridge that and create some tangible tools for employees to empower them to deliver better experiences. So example of tools could be, you know, training, leadership practices, toolkits, other artifacts. Um, and we can talk in more detail about some of those. But that to me is really the, the probably the most difficult part, the most important part to be able to translate that data into action. The third and fourth capabilities I'll talk about, again, we support across the department, technology. So we're the sponsor for a lot of cross-cutting integrated technology initiatives for the department, such as contact center modernization, digital modernization, management of data across the enterprise. This is a unique capability of our office because we do see horizontally. So we're not looking sort of vertically in one business line. We're sort of stepping in the shoes of the veteran and saying, okay, 
How does a veteran CVA, they see it as one big agency, how do we create that seamless and integrated experience with multiple touch points, whether it's by phone or digitally? The fourth and final core capability that we offer the department is really about engagement. So really keeping connected to community partners, veteran engagement boards, strategic partnerships, and distributing information to a wide swath of veterans and their families so we can have that sort of information distribution and listening channel in local communities as well. So data tools, tech and engagement, that's how we support. And, you know, human-centered design, that's kind of like a natural concept, I guess, when you're talking about the veteran experience. And there's so many agencies that are, you know, delving into it. VA is seen as among the leaders around that. And you've spoken about before all the private industry areas that you guys are even inspired by. Like, what are some of the principles of human-centered design that you guys are really driving at your office? Yeah, I mean, I think human-centered design to me is really the best way to do the best government. And it's not necessarily intuitive because I think a lot of times, at least, you know, having been in government for 15 years, there are a lot of external drivers, right? In terms of, you know, you have a new project, maybe it has interest from, you know, congressional partners. We want to make sure we get on it and get on it quickly. Human-centered design to me is a way to start with a more intentional and deliberative approach so you can then speed up later. So it's sort of like investing that time up front to A, again, identify what the journey is of the most important person that you're trying to serve, which is the customer, right? So we're able to deliver the best value to them and understand from their perspective, not based on our org chart, but based on their journey and interaction, what are the most important moments that matter to them? And I'll give a kind of a quick example if I can, a tangible example that I always like to use because it's a low tech, it's not um, super complicated. I think it's easy to understand. So one example for me of the power of experience has to go back to a moment that matters most that we discovered doing our research or human-centered design research with veterans in their healthcare experience. So we went out to the field, talked to you know, uh, many, many veterans from different ages and demographics, and we created a journey map in partnership with the Veterans Health Administration on the outpatient experience. So one of the moments that mattered most that fell out of that research was navigation of a VA medical facility. Now, to me, navigation of a VA medical facility would never naturally appear on an operational dashboard. It just wouldn't, right? You're going to be talking about a number of appointments scheduled, number of surgeries conducted, right? The power of experience is that we were able to see that that is something that is really, really important to veterans, identified by veterans as important. So what do we do to then translate those insights into what? Into a tangible tool, into an action to respond to it. So we worked with the Veterans Health Administration, who had had different medical facilities, had had programs stood up to kind of help navigate facilities, um, ambassadors and greeters, but not all of them did. So we worked with VHA and branded and scaled across all medical centers this Red Coat Ambassador Program. So now when a veteran or, or their family member walks into a medical center, they'll see a greeter in a red coat or a red vest that welcomes them and helps them navigate these facilities because these buildings are oftentimes older buildings built on top of each other, kind of difficult to navigate. So that, is, that to me is a really powerful, very simple to understand example of how experience can be such a powerful tool to actually address moments that matter most. And it doesn't stop with just identifying the moment and creating the tool and translating it. We also want to measure our performance on the back end, right? So there's a measurement and impact at the end of the day. We do measure that as part of our real-time surveys. How easy was it for you to navigate VA medical centers? Why? Because that's a moment that matters most to a veteran. We've adapted this program with VHA, with Red Coats, and the ease of navigation has increased by four percentage points since we launched that program and scaled it. So again, proof positive that when you design with and for your customer, you're always, always, always going to produce better results for them. That's a great point. And I know when I, you know, visit a hospital, you know, in private, I don't get a greeter. Right, <laughs> so. right exactly. I mean, maybe it's a best practice for everyone, right? right. Something <laughs> to learn. So, you know, a huge aspect of the veteran experience I've been hearing, especially recently with new leadership changes and everything that's coming down the pipeline this year, is meeting the veteran where they are. How is VO adapting to some of these directives or it's, you know, it sounds like it's nothing new as far as you're concerned, but how is VEO approaching some of these leadership, I guess, initiatives? 
Yeah, well, I, I love, I appreciate this question. And I think we're so poised. We're so poised to be adaptive to this. And so one of the things I've been thinking a lot about uh, along with, you know, my my CX siblings across government is the one of the executive orders, many of them, but one specifically that the president signed on day one, which was about underserved populations and racial equality. In my mind, experience is a perfect match to help meet those aspirational goals, right? In terms of better understanding the needs of underserved veteran populations or other, and sort of doing those kind of having a better understanding of how they interact with, with VA and what those journeys are. So I think the, the exciting part is in VEO, we're at a certain level of maturity where we started in the first few years kind of at a macro, which I think, I think makes sense. I think you have to you start at the overarching veteran experience. As we've built our capability, as we've gotten more mature, we are now naturally able to dive deeper into different particular populations. So we are in the current, currently in the process of finalizing our first ever Women Veterans Benefits Journey Map, which is great. We're also going to be kicking off in um, the near future a some Journey Map HCD research on the experience of tribal veterans as well. So we have the infrastructure in place. And again, human-centered design being that methodology, that driver that enables us to better understand these different populations. And in my opinion, that really makes us very, very poised to respond to these and other executive orders and priorities because we're becoming more sophisticated at understanding different segments of our population and applying that same framework, right? So understanding, journey mapping, identifying moments that matter, building tools to enable us to deliver better experiences, and then measuring our impact on the back end. So, you know, you mentioned the journey map already and some of the I guess, projects that come out of your office, the toolkits and everything, you know, you recently released the customer service cookbook. Talk to me about that. How do you see that influencing VA at large? So let's get cooking. I always love that. So I love cooking. <laughs> I do. I do love cooking. So the cookbook, and I, I, I appreciate you um, asking about that. So as part of our role in the President's Management Agenda Cross Agency Priority Goal Cap Goal on improving customer experience um, last cycle in the last administration, we were co-leads with that with OMB, which was really an incredible opportunity for us to share how VA has done it. It's not the only way, but it's a way for VA to have stood up this customer experience capability in the last number of years. And so one of the things, uh, one of the signals uh, that we saw from our siblings across agencies was, how did you guys do it? How did you guys get started? So oftentimes, even to this day, which I love, it's one of the favorite, my favorite parts of the job. And also in the past, the past few years, we have brothers and sisters from different agencies asking us just to walk through how we've done it and what our capabilities are. So what we thought was, gosh, there seems to be a demand signal out there, right? Like to memorialize some way how we at VA and, and others have approached it. So we wanted to put together a document. And what fun is a document if it's just kind of a boring white paper, right? And so we came up with this construct of a cookbook. And the thing that resonates with me about that is that like any recipe, there are key ingredients, right? There are specific adaptations you have to make based on, you know, your own preference or, you know, the people you're feeding. And there's a sequence of things that you have to follow. And so we wanted to kind of put something on paper that gave our brothers and sisters across agencies and within VA an understanding of what are those key ingredients or core levers across government, because they are common across executive branch government, that you could utilize knowing your ecosystem, because you're the one that knows it the best, adapting and sequencing based on your own agency ecosystem and putting together your own recipe to sort of bake it in. And so what you see are kind of two parts of the cookbook. You've got an overview of the, the key ingredients and all the levers that you could utilize. And then you've got a, an agency-specific recipes part, which showcases how different agencies have applied different ingredients. And you'll see in the one that we wrote for VA, almost every ingredient of the cookbook we've leveraged at one point or another. So we took a very multi-pronged strategic approach over many, many years. But our hope is that this will be a really good tool for brothers and sisters in the executive branch, and frankly, our brothers and sisters potentially on Capitol Hill as well, to utilize to help build and mature their own customer experience capability. And we're not talking about like complicated ingredients here, right? <laughs> no, no, very well. I mean, well known and you know easy to identify. For one example, agency priority goals, right? So those are goals that every single executive branch agency has to identify. 
every two year for a two year cycle. You know what? Maybe one of your ingredients is going to be advocating for an experience APG to elevate experience. It's got visibility. Organizationally, we hold ourselves accountable. We're on the hook for it. And it's something that we need to report on. That was a strategy that we employed. We've had an experience APG since 2015 and continue to advocate to have an experience APG along with another you know, two to three that are in the mix as an agency priority goal. Again, to put a stake in the ground that experience is a co-equal measure of our performance and needs to be addressed and supported. That's amazing. The, you know, I would advocate for like a government experience officer just mm-hmm. across the board. <laughs> Absolutely. And I know there, it's interesting. I, I think now experience, because a lot of agencies are sort of proving the concept, I think there's definitely a demand signal for that. There've been a lot of conversations amongst the community of practice about what, wow, that would be a really great opportunity to start solving problems across agencies in a cross-agency way, right? Because as members of the public, the public sees federal government, just like veterans see VA. Wouldn't it be a great capability for us to start looking and solving problems horizontally for the populace instead of having to kind of, you know, break it down into potential stovepipe solutions? So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. I think the time is ripe now. I think there's a lot of hunger for that. And I think it's being driven again by a lot of these executive orders coming out with this administration where, again, experience is totally poised to meet those aspirational goals and be the the mechanism with which to do it. And especially, um, you know, people like you, you make the field of the user experience just so enticing. I mean, it, I it, so. it sounds fun. You know? <laughs> it is. Well, it's fun. It's a very, it's a very, very vibrant space and it's a very dynamic environment. And the thing that I love about it, a lot of times people think, oh, government, you know, it's bureaucratic and boring. Uh-uh. It's a very creative space. And I think experience allows us to stay creative. Why? Because we're always needing to adapt and learn deeper and have a better understanding of those we're serving and create these solutions around those moments. So it's a very vibrant and dynamic environment. And I would encourage any listener to jump into the CX world that we're in in government. It's a great place to be. Did you think you would be, you know, doing this back in your attorney days? I mean, no way, right? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't have imagined it. And, and it's funny because when I, when I decided to come over to this office, again, it was very new. It was, you know, barely a year old. People thought I was crazy. People thought I was absolutely bonker. Why, why, what are you doing? And what is this office? And is it going to even be here in a year, right? And this was, this was right before the election in 2016. So I think a lot of my friends and, and colleagues were, you know, a little bit worried about me, like, oh my gosh, what if the office is eliminated and goes away? But, you know, for me, and, and this is something I always share with folks, you've always got to have passion, right? You've always got to have and find your passion. What is that fire inside you that keeps you motivated? Because there are going to be days that are difficult. I mean, this office was a startup. It was not a foregone conclusion. It wasn't certain that it was going to remain or thrive or stick around. And what kept me so energized and so engaged and hopeful and tactfully, hopefully relentless was just this core belief that this is why we're here. We're here to serve the people. Big P, people, the people. We're here to serve the people, not the bureaucracy first, the people first. And I truly believe that a focus on experience really enables us to practice that virtue. Amazing. Do you ever get to uh, exercise your your lawyer hat at all? Or you know, is that just gone? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's not gone. So, you know, it actually, the, I would say, and I always say this to anybody who, you know, if I ever mentor, they're like, should I go to law school? I always encourage everybody to go to law school because at the very least, it is a great way to train for analytics. I mean, I use my, I believe I use my analytical skills that I I learned in, in law school and when I got my master's as well, every single day. And I really, really enjoy this type of practice because the analytics and understanding your environment, navigating, you know, government, and which sometimes can have very narrow crevices, as we know, for good reason, check and balance is a, a, an important part of how we operate. But I think being able to anticipate and analyze and apply all the reason sort of uh, skills that I developed in law school, hopefully has been a help to this office. Amazing. Well, looking ahead at some of the things that are coming down the pipeline at VEO or VA at large, government at large, is there anything you're most excited about? You know, we have emerging technology on the horizon, AI, the promise of automation, and obviously this is 
a new office in the grand scheme of things. So what are you seeing that's exciting? Well, you know, aside from, you know, sort of the tactics, right? I mean, AI, 100%, the technology enablers that we have today, than, you know, rather than 10 years ago, I mean, we're, we government at large, I think are in a great, great place. I think for me, what I'm most excited about is really about this movement around experience and the energy around it, the hunger, I think that people feel to just want more, want to understand it more, want to be part of it. And it's about us getting back to basics, I think, as public servants. You know, I think the opportunity we have is great, particularly to build, and I keep going back to human-centered design. I think human-centered design as a core business practice in government is really the now and the future. And frankly, I think people will get energized around that because they're really getting connected with those that we serve and the needs of those that we serve. I think the other opportunity I see is really not only across executive branch agencies, right? So really building this community of practice even further, helping each other along the way in different agencies, but the cross branch collaboration. So I see our siblings on the Hill as a, a just a different channel of feedback, right? So the same folks that are maybe coming to VA directly, veterans and their families, they're also connecting with their members. And so I see a great opportunity to bridge between the executive branch and the legislative branch to share best practices. How do you all solve, you know, some of your customer experience challenges, opportunities? How do we in the executive branch solve those as well? What are the commonalities and overlaps? And I think there probably are many, honestly. So I see that as a giant opportunity for us to really bring government into a a new era, a new way of thinking and doing business with human-centered design at center and the cross-pollination and collaboration across branches as a key driver of that. Wow. Well, collaborations are certainly growing as far as what I'm seeing. You know, this pandemic kind of proved that we're we're so disparate and remote, but at the same time, I feel like collaboration has ramped up, you know, all the opportunities that is brought with just connecting everybody virtually like us right now, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. I totally agree. I, it's like, it's, you know, we're farther apart, but closer together right. in some ways as well. Yeah. Well, Barbara, I could ask you a million more questions, but I'm sure you have a ton of busy things on your schedule regarding the veteran experience. So I thank you so much for talking with me about your priorities at VEO. And I'm looking forward to seeing what else comes out of your office. Thank you so much for your time, Amy. Always happy to chat anytime. Appreciate it. GovCast is a production of Government CIO Media and Research. For more podcasts, head to our website. And please, if you liked what you heard, let us know by leaving us a review in iTunes. We continue to strive to help you connect with federal IT's top decision makers. Thanks for listening.